Hello everyone and welcome back to 3D Christianity. I'm John Hathaway and I'm your host and today we are going to be talking about the movie Inside Out 2 which I just I just saw in theaters yesterday uh, for the first time and I really enjoyed it. Um, but I think that a lot of the content on that movie is going to be valuable to talk about on this channel because it really um, it really does like a really good job about under about like uh, exploring human psychology, how our mind works, how our emotions work, and things like that. And <clears throat> I thought that there was a lot of uh, interesting takeaways from that movie. So. We're going to be talking about that in this episode. Now, if you enjoy this uh, channel and you enjoy the content that I put out, and if you want to see it continue and grow, uh, I would really appreciate it if you'd hit that thumbs up below and just make sure that you're subscribed to this channel if you're not already a subscriber. And I want to thank those of you who are subscribed already. I know that I haven't really produced a whole lot of videos over the past seven, eight months, but I just posted one last week and I want to try to get back on track of doing weekly episodes at least, at least one episode a week. So um, yeah, today we're going to be talking about Inside Out 2. So I wrote some notes down just of some observations and I may go off script here and there, but, um, but yeah, so we're going to be doing a review of Inside Out 2 and talk, talk about some of the uh, the takeaways that I noticed from there and everything. <clears throat> so what uh, Inside Out 2 is about, I mean, um, you'd probably, I'm sure maybe a lot of you have seen the first one called just called Inside Out, um, but if you're not familiar with the Inside Out series, basically what it is, it's a Disney Pixar uh, series and it's, um, it explores basically the inside of the human mind, uh, particularly dealing with um, emotions, but it's not just about our emotions, but it's about, uh, but but that's like the central focus is um, you have these different characters that play different emotions inside this girl named Riley's head. Um, Riley is the main character in both of the Inside Out movies. Um, well, you could say she in, in one way she's the main character, but there's also... I guess another main character in both of these movies, which her name is Joy. She is the probably the lead emotion in inside of Riley's mind. Uh, so, <clears throat> and then you have like in the first Inside Out movie, you have the five different emotions. There's joy, anger, fear, sadness, and disgust. And in the first movie, uh, basically Riley is like a preteen. I don't know, maybe 11, 12 years old, something like that. And she's, um, uh, she grows up very, uh, basically she's a happy, has a happy-go-lucky lifestyle, I mean, or mindset, and she's just very, a very joyful person. That's why Joy is seen as the, uh, kind of the leader of these emotions inside Riley's mind. And, um, and in that movie, uh, sadness begins to kind of, t uh, she kind of starts to creep her way in and uh, the other emotions they don't really they try to keep uh, sadness away like they are out of sight out of mind basically um, like there's one part in the first movie where she tells where joy tells sadness uh, I'm gonna draw this circle you just stay right there stay away from the uh, the control board of Riley's mind and everything everything like that but um, as you probably know, <laughs> sadness does not stay in the circle. She winds up taking over the controls here and there. And you find out um, towards the end of the movie, spoiler alert if you haven't seen the first movie, and I also probably will be giving some spoiler alerts or some spoilers for the second movie, so um, you may not want to watch too much further if you haven't seen that movie. But in the first movie, uh, you find out basically that sadness is um, something that that needs to be expressed in Riley's mind. It's something that needs to be felt, that Riley needs to feel because she um, she moved away from her home state. She moved from like Minnesota to California, 
and basically dealing with the stress of the move and with losing her old friends or not being able to be close to them and stuff like that. And um, she, she tries to remain happy and have a good attitude, but then later things go downhill and then she gets sad and runs away from home. And then she, and then she try she kind of, uh, turns off her emotions for a little bit, like just lets go of joy and sadness and just becomes like emotionless. But then joy makes joy and sadness make their way back into the control room because they get lost. And then, um, long story short, she breaks down very sad because she, um, she's been bottling up all this sadness, um, from the move and from everything else and getting used to adapting to a new, uh, a new environment, new culture and everything like that. So, uh, so yeah, that was the first movie in a nutshell. Now, Inside Out 2, Riley is now a teenager She's kind of uh, starting to face puberty and some of the challenges that come with uh, be being a teenager and things like that. And um, in this movie, basically, in the beginning, she is uh, she wins like a hockey game, and there's like there's some different coaches that are watching from other teams and things like that. And there's this one team that basically. Riley has idolized called the Firehawks and there's uh one of the I guess it's the team captain named Val that's uh like one of her idols basically that she wants to become like her and everything um and when this when the coach for that team sees them play she invites Riley and her two best friends Grace and um Bree to come to this hockey camp where they basically do these different tryouts and you can um, potentially join a different team, like a, a more popular team for a different school or something like that. So uh, obviously Riley's very excited about this. And um, also one of the interesting things about Inside Out 2 is that it, it starts to go deeper than just your base emotions. So. In, in the first movie, uh, the main thing that uh, that's on Riley, or maybe that's in Riley's mind is just these different emotions, like where her emotions are kind of at the control wheel and stuff like that. But as she moves up into the next stage, like into her teenage years, um, Joy, who is like the kind of the narrator for a lot of the movie and when you're inside Riley's mind, she talks about how Riley has these different beliefs. And I thought I find that very interesting. Um, it talks about, it kind of does some flashbacks of Riley's, of different things that happen in Riley's life where like some kid in school was, uh, had a, um, had like a experiment or a project or whatever that they were presenting. And then she messes up and drops a bunch of stuff on the floor. And then Riley's like trying to decide, do I help her? Do I, uh, do I sit back and laugh? Um, but she decides I'm going to do the right thing and I'm going to go help her. And then she introduces herself and they become best friends. And, um, and so one of her, one of her things that she, that is a belief about herself is that she is kind and that she is a good friend. And, uh, there's some different things like that, that, um, but basically it, um, it, it describes like all of Riley's beliefs put together in this movie. Uh, they call it her sense of self. And I guess her sense of self com with all her beliefs combined, it basically is that um, I am a good person. So that's Riley's sense of self is that she's a good por person. And that incorporates all the other beliefs that she has. Um, and... Um, <clears throat> and then, so as the movie goes on, when Riley's, um, like on her first day getting ready for hockey camp, um, with her two best friends and everything like that, she starts to experience some of these new emotions. And one of them is anxiety. That's probably the, the primary one that comes up. Um, uh, there's, well, there's actually like five new emotions. Four of them, um, are 
in most of the movie, and one of them is, like, basically just a teaser for maybe a future movie. But, like, so the primary one is Anxiety, and then you have Envy, and then there's one called Ennui, which basically means, like, boredom. And then there's Embarrassment. And then the last one that you get a glimpse of, but she, and she makes a couple appearances, but doesn't stay long. Her name is Nostalgia. It's like this old, represented as like an old lady. Uh, but they basically tell her like, no, we're not ready for you yet. You can come back after, maybe after graduation or after, um, you know, getting married, having kids, things like that, you know. Um, so these four new emotions show up in Riley's mind. And as Riley is making her way to hockey camp, she's riding, her parents are driving her and her two best friends to hockey camp. And then she finds out um, that as she might be going to this new school, um, her best friends are actually go going to be placed at a different school, most likely. And uh, this is obviously very sad news for Riley because she doesn't want to lose her best friends or, um, you know, drift apart and things like that. Um her friends assure her that they'll still be, you know, they'll always, you know, be best friends and they'll still be in contact with e with each other. But in Riley's mind, her anxiety starts to take over and she uh, basically thinks like she's going to lose them. So once, um, once Riley gets to camp, she meets Val and uh, Val again is the like the team captain, basically the star player of the Firehawks, which is the team that Riley wants to play for. Uh, and she idolizes Val. She wants to be like her. She wants to, she wants to be approved and accepted by her. And, um, and then later, uh, she struggles with basically, Riley struggles with, uh, basically trying to remain loyal to her friends and to try to, you know, keep them included and stuff like that. And then also trying to be approved and ex accepted by Val and by the Firehawks, by those, uh, new, uh, that new team basically that she wants to play for. And so, um, there's a part in the movie where when they're going in for practice and then they're splitting up into different teams, and this is just camp, so they're practicing playing against each other. And instead of going to play, play uh, like in Riley's mind, they're trying. She's trying to figure out: should I play with my friends and stay loyal, or should I go and play with Val, who I'm trying to, you know, go under her wing and um, and be, you know, appear cool or be accepted by them. So she, um, she decides, I want to go, I want to play with Val. She decides to, uh, kind of abandon her friends, basically. Um, and she doesn't say I'm abandoning you, but essentially that's what she's doing. And, um, <clears throat> so, sorry, I'm looking down at my notes here. So I apologize if I stop to do that every, every now and then, but, um, but anyway, so, uh, Riley begins to experience these new emotions and anxiety uh, takes the forefront of her emotions. And as anxiety kind of takes over, what, what happens next is that, um, joy and sadness and, and the other old emotions, they, they don't like these new emotions and they don't like, they don't like anxiety. They think that she's making wrong decisions with, which obviously it appears that, uh, she is doing some things that are not so good or making Riley do things that are not so good. Um, so they try to stop her, but then, um, anxiety basically, uh, they say something about, you can't just bottle us up. And then anxiety is like, Oh, that's a good idea. And then she puts them in a jar and pokes holes in the lid and says, okay, well, uh, we're going to take you to, you know, the back of Riley's mind basically. So, 
essentially she's bottling up her old emotions and now anxiety is at the forefront of her mind. She's trying to be a people pleaser, trying to be accepted by this new, um, this new group and everything like that, become popular. Um, and then one thing, so I talked before about the beliefs that Riley had, like that she's a good person, that she's kind, that she's a good friend. Uh, and well, once anxiety starts taking over, she goes and she starts establishing these new beliefs. Like one of the first things I think that um, happens that changes a belief in her mind is if uh, is like if I can be accepted by Val, and I I may not be saying it, I'm not quoting it verbatim, but just from my memory, I think she said like if I can be accepted by Val, then maybe I can play for the Firehawks. So that was like one of her first new beliefs that she had. And then she started having incorporating all these other beliefs like um, if I um, if I do what these if I do what Val um, or if I like the things that Val likes, then I'll be accepted by her. Uh, if I don't like the things that she doesn't like, then I won't be accepted by her. And essentially, um, it boils down to when the, when Riley's playing this game uh, that, um, in this, like I guess their final game or whatever, in hockey camp that's going to determine basically whether she may win or may get the... Uh, to be able to be on the new team or not. And she starts having, she's just so anxious because she's trying so hard. She's been practicing all week and she's been um, hanging out with her new friends and kind of not really with her old friends. And so she's dealing with all, all this anxiety of trying to live up to these expectations. And then her, this new core belief pops up in her mind and it's, that I am not good enough. So before she had the belief that I am a good person, and now in contrast she has this new belief that I am not good enough. And that's very interesting. Um, and what it winds up doing, she has all these beliefs while she's playing this game, and it, it causes her to be penalized because uh, she, well first she's not doing very good, she misses a lot of shots and everything like that, and then she winds up getting penalized for uh, being too aggressive or something like that. Um, <clears throat> so she gets, she has to get benched basically. And, um, and then, um, so that's where my notes end. So I'm just going to be going off script from here. So, um, so yeah, after this, uh, you know, there's, you kind of have two narratives in this movie. You have the narrative from inside of Riley's mind and then also uh, outside where she's dealing with her relationships with her friends and stuff. And then also you have the the her own emotions having their own journey and stuff like that where the old emotions are trying to find their way back to the forefront of Riley's mind and stuff like that and, and not be bottled up. And... So what winds up happening is, and I think it's just, I love this movie because it depicts things so well. Like you've probably heard the term a flood of, of emotions before. Basically what winds up happening is they, um, the old emotions, they wind up going to some like vault and um, inside of Riley's mind and like her old, uh, all her old beliefs and all her old memories and stuff like that where those are all stored. And they do something to cause, like, basically an eruption of all those old emotions where they all come out at once. And it's basic, and then it cause, it shows, like, this water and all these um, memories that are representatives. Re they're represented or sh illustrated by, the, like, these orb things, like these glass orbs or whatever that show a picture, kind of like a crystal ball or something like that. But they all come flooding in in this um, giant flood. And then as this happens, while this is while Riley is benched, I think, that this happens, she's, she begins to go into uh, like an anxiety attack or a panic attack where her heart starts racing and she's like um, trying not to cry and she's like just 
experiencing all this anxiety and um, and then she winds up uh, she starts to control her breathing a little bit she starts breathing a little bit slower and then one interesting thing that she does is it shows Riley's hand um, like scratching the wood on the bench or on the side of the armrest or something like that um, and that is basically what that represents is it's a, a grounding mechanism a grounding exercise uh, she does two things to kind of ground herself uh, and basically what that means when when in like a psychological sense of grounding yourself is when you're experiencing anxiety um, or panic attacks and things like that um, it can be very easy to just go into this spiral of negativity and um, and where you just you get trapped inside your mind and sometimes you have to find a way to ground yourself or to pull yourself into the real world and stop like letting your your thoughts and your mind just um, run you a hundred percent and one of those things that you can do is uh, breathing slow like focusing on your breathing that's one thing that you'll find in a lot of like uh, meditation exercises and like exercises breathing exercises or whatever that try to that can help you to manage your emotions and your manage your uh, you know keep your thoughts under control and stuff like that or your anxiety one of those things is to is to learn these breathing exercising or breathing exercises and one of the other things is to like plant your feet on the ground or you know find some feel something uh, whether you're like if you're outside maybe brushing your hand against a tree or against grass or you know walking barefoot on grass or something like that and just feeling your environment around you and that kind of puts you back into reality and takes you out of your own mind so so that was very interesting I liked that part of the movie um, now maybe this part will <laughs> I might start to this might get a little more controversial for for some of my audience um, so if you're like a fundamentalist Christian uh, if you grew up very strict or like basically where you were expected to um, like follow all these rules and have all these um, these different standards and like dress a certain way you couldn't listen to certain kinds of music couldn't watch certain kinds of movies uh, you had to you were expected to read your Bible a certain amount of time every day and pray a certain amount of time every day uh, going out and uh, witnessing soul winning things like that making sure that you go to church at least two or three times a week um, all kinds of different stuff like that um, if you grow if you grew up that way and I didn't grow up that way per se I did I was in uh, a religious in environment like that in church for probably I don't know 10 to 12 years it's it's it was quite a long time <clears throat> um, and I did grow up visiting different kinds of churches that were more like that and my I grew up in a pretty strict household um, as well uh, but it wasn't necessarily this exactly the same as like growing up in a in a legalistic church setting so it's, it's a little bit different but um, and I'm not saying any of this to like attack anybody or anything like that or, or I'm not bitter towards anyone anything like that but um, but like in the in a legalistic church environment fundamentalist legalistic church environment um, you'll notice that one of the things that is like a core belief among most of the people in those churches is that they are not good people it's like you you have these songs like uh, I, I think like amazing grace it, I think it talks about like uh, such a like you have these terms like such a worm as I or uh, calling yourself like wretched and um, sinful and like you know, I'm just this horrible person and like it almost seems like um, it almost seems like some Christians like 
they feel better about themselves when they talk about how horrible of a person they are. And they think like it, it's like virtue signaling, or at least that's how it appears to me. Like when you talk about, oh yeah, I'm just, uh, yeah, I was saved, but I'm just, I'm just a horrible person, but I'm just a sinner on my way to heaven. Um, and I'm not saying that that's like theologically wrong necessarily. I, I mean, I think I have some disagreements. I won't really go into all that right now, but, um, but basically I think this movie is the reason I'm talking about all that is because this movie brings a lot of that into my mind about these different beliefs that Riley has. And when she, when she has these beliefs that I'm a good person and that, you know, that she's, um, that she's kind and things like that. Well, she's, when she has those beliefs, she is in genuine faith. She's acting out of authenticity of her, her real self. And then she starts trying to be like a people pleaser and she, she like lets anxiety take over. And that's when things start spiraling out of control. And she starts um, living for the approval of others. And, and I've seen that so much in religious settings that I grew up in, in fundamentalism. And it just, um, it, it really struck a chord. And, um, when I saw that movie, I'm like, wow, this is like, uh, this explains a lot. <laughs> explains about like how I, when I was in that kind of a legalistic church setting, um, I always, I, I was always, uh, felt like I wasn't living up to my potential. I always felt kind of like a fraud or like I had imposter syndrome where, um, I felt like I wasn't good enough and I, I don't belong here. I should be, I should be in hell. I should be, um, you know, all, all this kind of negative thoughts. And I don't think that that's a good thing necessarily. Um, I'm not attacking anyone if you have those kind of beliefs. If if your uh, if your belief system tells you that you're a horrible person and that you're uh, basically you have to live perfectly righteous and um, you have to agree to all our particular set of beliefs and we can't differ on any opinions or or you're going to hell. If that's your if that's your belief system. Um, you know, you do you. I'm not, I'm not attacking anyone. I'm not casting any judgment, but, but I, I just think it's so much more freeing and it's so much more healthy. Um, when you learn to basically put those beliefs away and you start living in, um, just living in authenticity, just be yourself. You know, if, if you have faults, you know, just, just admit them and learn to I would say stop judging yourself for your faults. Um, just be open about them. And, you know, if you're, if you're open about them, usually, uh, you can learn to overcome them a little bit better. And a lot of times you might find that some of the faults you have are not really actually sinful per se, uh, from a biz biblical perspective, because a lot of the things that we grew up being taught in church, uh, that our sins were not really sins growing, I mean, are not really sins according to the Bible. Uh, but that's another episode for another day. Anyway, I think I've, uh, I think I've said basically what I need to say. Um, if you enjoyed this video again, I would just, if you haven't already, please click that like button and subscribe and hit the bell notification so that you don't miss any future content. Thank you again for watching and I hope you have a blessed day. I'll talk to you later.